Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you once again for tuning in. Um, how are you doing? I trust you're well and safe with your families during this coronavirus times. Um, Today we have another episode again of Facing the Facts and I am your host, humbly me, Pamela Bonkium. So the main aim of this program is to have an open and objective discussion to empower ourselves with information which should help us make informed decisions or choices, right? So the intended result is to get us to think holistically in seeking solutions to society's problems. Are you with me? So, uh, a topic we shall be exploring today that you already know is oil and gas. So, what do you know about it? Uh, I don't know much. Uh, I'm hoping to by the end of this. Uh, I find that most people's experiences will be one of resource curse through constantly hearing about mismanagement of resources, degradation of land issues, and the list goes on and on. But today, we're doing things slightly differently. We'll be looking at both sides of the coin, and who best will it be but an expert? to help us swim through the murky waters of oil and gas. So with tremendous legal expertise on the continent for broken deals in the petroleum and power sectors, he is optimistic that Africa can reverse the current trend of research misuse and deploy them towards societal development. He has used his work to ensure that oil and gas are used for the common good. He's the founder and CEO of the African Energy Chamber. He's also the founder and CEO of the Pan-African Legal Juggernaut Centurion Law Group. In 2015, Forbes, there has to be Forbes, Forbes named him one of the top 10 most influential men in Africa. He is an author and has published Big Barrels, African Oil and Gas and the Quest for Prosperity that he published in 2017. And this year, on the, well, that was last year, sorry, on the 22nd of October uh, 2019, he published Billions at Play, The Future of African Energy and Doing Deals. So his books explain how the oil and gas industry in Africa can reverse the so-called uh, resource curse with examples from various countries on the continent. I have been opportunity to read some of his, the two of his books. Uh, so some of the knowledge you see jogging in there, but I think it's about time we meet NJ Ayuk. So welcome, NJ. Thank you, NJ, for joining us. Uh, Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, that's such a great introduction. Uh, I could tell you, at my funeral, you probably should be speaking on my behalf. Uh. Oh, <laughs> I've got a drug life. <laughs> 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 so thank you. I'm not sure how to call you because your name is NJ Ayuk, so I'm not sure if I should address you, Mr. Ayuk, or you just prefer us. Ayuk, Ayuk is fine. Fine. Okay, yeah. great. So thank you for coming on the show and uh, thank you for responding so promptly when we uh, we came calling. And uh, before we proceed, we just wish to remind you, our audience, to uh, send your questions and comments throughout the interview for Ayuk. So um, Ayuk, we're just very curious and we wanted to know what NJ stands for. <laughs> It's actually NJ. It was uh, it used to be NJAC, but it's called uh, um, since I was a kid, and I just kept it that way. Okay. Uh, and and uh, it's it's like five different. Uh, um, you know, you have the English name and everything, and yeah. since they calling that at when you we were like a year old, and you just stay that way, and it's been that way ever since. And uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> part of that journey of being Cameroonian and then living in different places. Yeah. And then oh man, uh, it makes it a, a very, very unique. <laughs> you know, life. So did you make a choice to hide? Because I find it hard to believe that Cameroonians don't really know about you till date. And how I managed to know about you is because Rebecca in Long Chong took a picture with you and she was talking about, oh, you guys know him, he's Cameroonian, he's written the book. And I'm like, what? Who is this guy? So I went looking and researching and that's when I found out your work. So you books and I'm just like, how do we not know about you? Like, we don't know about you. You've been hiding, haven't you? You do this on purpose. Um. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, I don't know if I, if I should say hi. I think you you get caught up and you get focused on what matters. I, 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 I Cameroon is my, in my blood. I, you know, like I always say, I'm a Mamfe boy. Um, everything about Cameroon is in me. But also you have to sometimes understand that you're not deeply limited by it. And you, as an, at, the, at the end of the day, you're an African and you do work where you're welcome and you 
things that really help you. And with where we are today in whether it is in Cameroon or in Africa, you have to deeply search your sense of humanity. And wherever you can make any good or any change, it matters. As much as I would love to be with the kids in the dusty, dusty streets around Manfe when I, where I grew up, it, 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 it makes no difference if I'm with kids in Bamenda or in Boya or in Yaoundé or in Douala or in Kuwaito or in Dakar, Senegal. Mm-hmm. And I think the more we, as a community, you let your work speak for itself mm-hmm. and people will find out the work that you're doing. And when they find out the work that you're doing, it's, it's like I, I tell a lot of young people around Africa that I, that I, that I meet that said, the more you maintain your sense of who you are and you maintain discipline and have a sense of uh, um, you, you, you being more of a workhorse, it, it, it's more. And uh, whatever happens, the time will come. So if you buy a book, one day Pamela will find out the book and you and, and then the book will become popular. <laughs> Oh, Amen. I take those, <laughs> and I'll follow your lead and put PD Bonkiyong instead of Pamela Bonkiyong. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so we're glad we found you, and um, you know, thank you for for highlighting that you come from Mamfe. So at least people know a little about you. But from the name, people were just guessing. So where did you you grew up in Mamfe, right? What schools did you attend whilst you were in Cameroon? You know, um, I, I was lucky that I had parents who. I was born in 1980, so I'm really old, 40, and uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm really old. It's, it's uh, I'm an old man, and uh, <laughs> you, I, my parents worked for the Presbyterian um, mission, and so my mom was a teacher. Works for Tesbi Song Abang, which was never into Mamfe. Mm-hmm. I was born on that campus. And my, my dad was also a teacher. My dad went to the United States when I was a little kid. So I grew up in that uh, mission campus. And I think some people always ask the values that shape you and get to make you who you are. I started learning everything about life being, we, we were living in that boarding, that college campus. So, uh, mm-hmm how to go to church every Sunday. We learned how to join the YP. And you didn't, have, you didn't have a choice, you know, you were forced to. And if you, and then grandma came to live with us and grandma didn't know biology or zoology, but yeah. she, she knew stickology and she knew slapology. And, you know, <laughs> one of them had to work and you get to go to Sunday school every Sunday and you, you, you did school in there. Yeah. So that, 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 that space, that area was a very, very high, it, it really influenced me, my family, a lot of friends. Mm-hmm. And it really helped me also to get connected with a lot of people because living in a mission school environment and having kids come from everywhere around the country to go to school there, you get yeah. to meet. You know, if, if my if my mom is tough with uh, Pam Pam in, in, in class, if I walk as a class, I get the slap or I get the heat like mm-hmm. mom did. So, it, but he also he was so good because we made a lot of friends. We had a lot of big brothers and big sisters that guarded. Mm-hmm. So, um, it was a blessing. And I, today, no matter where I go, mm-hmm. I get people who they don't they might not know me but they know my dad they know my mom mm-hmm. and, you know so when they come i'm like um okay you better be good okay because you don't you never know what people think about teachers you exactly. know? oh no we were truly blessed to come yeah. from that and i think it guarded me all through most of what we do that faith-based education was really key but yeah. it also it in a sense where we saw, you know, some tough times, poverty. Mm-hmm. We also, you know, I, I don't know how my mom got through it with the salary she had, mm-hmm. but it, it, you know, okay, 
you got to you, you, you got to get it together you got to yeah. you, you got to go for it and yeah. a lot of opportunities came because we were of that community and here I am today I took some of the opportunities and made good use of it and it helped me oh wow your parents must be very proud though if <laughs> i don't know you, it's mother's day and i haven't called my mom yet so i don't know how proud she is and i'm <laughs> <laughs> she will never tell you. We only tell her friends, so <laughs> forget it. <laughs> so, um, if you did your higher education in Cameroon, do you think you would be working in oil and gas today? I don't. No, I don't think it, 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 it is where I did my higher education. I never went to law school or business school to work in oil and gas. It was never something that I. I didn't even know what oil and gas was when I was in uh, law school, and even. In School. I hated oil and gas. I never <laughs> oil and gas industry. I uh, I felt it was horrible because of everything that I was being told about the resource industry. I mean, don't forget in the early nineties. Um, that's why I'm saying I'm very old. In the early nineties, you had civil wars in Sierra Leone. You had civil wars in the Congo, in Liberia. And a lot of these had to do with natural resources, whether it was diamonds or it is um, some of the oil um, extraction out with Niger Delta. You had a war going on with UNITA and the NPLA in um, in Angola and most and South Sudan and Sudan. So most of the the wars around Africa, a lot of it was getting connected with natural resources. So. You, you just felt like, ouch, I don't want to be, be around these guys. Yeah? It's, it's really horrible. You know, so you, you had a chance. You went to law school. I wanted to be a human rights lawyer. And that was what I wanted to be. And uh, I had a chance to work with the United Nations. Mm-hmm. And I was actually sent to work in at Darfur. In, uh, yeah. And that's when you had a lot of issues with, with slavery and you had a lot of issues with uh, gender-based violence and, 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 and rape as a, a weapon of war. So I, I was actually working on with those issues. And some of the people I worked with challenged me to pay attention to the natural resource sector, which honestly, I knew nothing about. Today, I can teach and lecture about oil and gas. I had to learn, train myself. Mm-hmm. I had to take a lot of training training courses that I never had, and, and I know most people don't believe when I say I never had one oil and gas class in law school, in business school, or in undergrad. If I, if there was anything about oil and gas, I'll be running away. And it, it's, it's all about where life takes you and where you get interest and how you define your own angle to things and how you can shape things. And that's just what I did. Okay. Well, that's interesting to note, especially um, that sometimes you find your calling in doing something else, <laughs> um, which is not what um, you would hear a lot of people talk about because people step up by saying, I want to do this and they get into it. But you sort of got in there because somebody brought your attention to pay attention to that. Talking about your writing, you, you say you're old, some would say you aren't, but I was. I, I, this is a comment I actually wrote. I've got a notebook here when I was reading your books because I read the chapter on Uganda on big barrels and you were, you started by with a football match <laughs> and I was just thinking to myself you write like an old soul and your writing is permeated by sprinklings of nostalgia whether or not you you intend to or not but it, it's evident but you're not that old you, you write like someone from the 60s uh, <laughs> because that's how they always start like the mechanistic kick um, I'm never I, I, I always tired of hearing of that <laughs> that football match into, you know Roger Miller does this does that you know even 16 year olds who are very fanatic about football know that but coming back to um you know your oil and gas um in in a in a, in, in a 2018 interview with forbes you credited a dr ron walters who was jesse jackson's deputy campaign manager as the person who inspired and shaped your belief in justice so how did he do that i think he was a good he was a great mentor he he ran the um, African American Leadership Center at the University of Maryland, where I was a student. And he, you know, at that stage, he always find try to find people in life who are going to shape um, a lot of what you do. 
and what you're not going to accomplish. And I think I was just very lucky. He took so much keen interest in me. I think I was probably too crazy for him not to pay attention. And uh, he asked me one thing. He said, you know, you're going to have to decide in life if you're going to be a social parasite or a social engineer. And he, and he was talking about Charles Hamilton Houston. And then he also taught me a sense of saying, you know, you've got to be proud of who you are and where you come from, being and being Cameroonian, but also it doesn't stop with you being able to get a lot of fits, uh, a lot of uh, brilliant education and all these opportunities, but it also depends on how you use that to shape whatever you do, whether it is, whether it is corporations, whether it is um, society. And I think that had a clear resonation with, with me and what I do. And I think a lot of people sometimes forget that um, many of us have been lucky because there were a lot of other kids who I believe were way smarter than me and a lot of other kids um, who I believe are way better than me. A lot of other kids whom I believe know um, are better than anything I could ever dream of. But they just didn't get the opportunities I had. They just didn't get the openings I had. And they just didn't, uh, they weren't at the right place at the right time and didn't have the right kind of mentors like Ron Waters and others who have really been there to shape uh, my life. And I think that is, that, that is, that is a good thing which, which happened to me. And I just wish it could happen to a lot other young people and a lot of other people whom I um, whom day in day out struggle to find mentors or just people whom they can lean on. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned in the same interview that your parents drilled into you what your role in society was despite all the injustices that you were surrounded by growing up. So how did your parents define your role towards society? Because in Cameroon we always have this um, argument or discussions around civic duty and our responsibilities as citizens towards our country. So what was it that your parents did that was different? I think it, it, it was that it was that community where you were raised where you were raised. You know, first parents are always scared about you being um, getting involved, whether it comes with social justice issues or issues where they might think you might get hurt. But also there was always that freedom at home to have discussions, no matter how tough they were, but you were always um, cautioning them about being there. Yeah, but also as a child, and that's what that's, I mean, I'm a father right now, you get to see kids who, um, kids can be very inquisitive. My daughter asked me some questions, which, and I'm like, oh my God, you know, if you, if you, if, if you were growing up in Cameroon, they would have knocked the shit out of you. you know? But uh, he, he just had to sit back there. I mean, she would ask, she would ask, she would, she would ask me, "Why do you love mommy?" And uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, why did you get married? You know, I, I get that question asked by my daughter. That like, okay, you got to say that. Okay, you got to explain it, and that's fine. But you know, he, sometimes you just got to look at the environment. And I remember in nineteen eighty eight. 89, 90, it was a very tense environment oh. in Cameroon. You were seeing a move towards um, multi-party um, change in the country, a more active citizens in three around the country. It was the first time when you start having ghost towns or people want to talk about justice in a way that it has never been talked about in the country. And you had to... You had to, and I was lucky that I had a mother that was down and paid keen attention to that. And beyond Cameroon, you also had the anti apartheid movement being very, very strong. I mean, a lot of kids had passports at that time, and they said for every country except South Africa, and you got to ask, you got to ask why. And on my birthday, Nelson Mandela was 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 taken out of jail 
So I had to ask why nobody wanted to deal with my birthday. Everybody was uh, being loud and running to the field. Well, and then my mom was like, she, like, come on, you know, you, she got to explain that. And, you know, so, so you have this feeling of being born on February 11th, which is either Youth Day in Cameroon or Mandela getting out of jail. So you're the lonely kid clamoring for attention, like, who is going who is going to celebrate my birthday so that answers your question why you said i've been hiding because <laughs> there's no way i can outshine nelson mandela and the UK. so you know i just hide my own little comment and i i try to write <laughs> my favorites yeah the 90s weren't a very good years for africa like you've highlighted lots of wars uh, I suppose the, the the positive thing to come out of that was uh, Nelson Mandela and for South Africans, well, I would say for me, Serafina. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it was a good grounding for the kids in the 90s. So um, you, you did get a first degree in government and politics, which was followed by a law degree. And uh, so why did you choose to add an MBA to that mis mix of government, politics and law? I, it is a sense of economic justice. When you, you have to always pay, there's a lot of people who talk politics, there's a lot of people who talk law. And I felt if you are going to play in the game, huh. you have to know your money. You would have to know your math. You would have to know how business work. And I think most people who are interested in really changing or shaping communities one way or another, they tend to ignore what really matters when it comes to money. Hmm. They tend to really ignore issues when it comes to corporate justice and understanding how business works. And I think sometimes fail in entrepreneurship because you want to be the counter entrepreneurs. And even some entrepreneurs who might meet all around Africa and they have a lot of great ideas I always say you got to look at your bottom line, your return on investment. So doing an MBA um, it costs a lot of money, but it really, really helped me hone my management skills, my ability to look at finances, my ability to look at all facets of a business, human resources. Am I really ready for this? How to question everything with regards to case studies and whether it is looking at accounting statements or financial statements. So someone doesn't walk in front of you and then use on you with something which you don't even know. So mm -hmm. it really helped shape, shape, um, shape to me because I came from a very legal background which just gave you a chance to look around unjust and uh, just, and but you stop thinking about big things. And I think an MBA really helped me with it. something I would encourage with a lot of people who are mm -hmm. in social justice, in law, in other things. And it might not be an MBA, it might be a mini MBA, it might be any kind of certificate, even if it's not a certificate, just do something that helps you understand business and that understand how to run it because I have seen a lot of people with really great ideas, but they end up failing because it's not because the ideas are not bright or they are not bright, but just because they fail to look at how to manage your finances and how to check your passion plus their output. So you've got to look at everything so that it's going to help you to really accomplish those goals. And it, it did work for me, and I hope it can work for a lot of other people. Okay. I mean, some people would have the counter argument of saying that, you know, in Africa, especially in Cameroon in particular, the most successful businessmen are successful businessmen are actually not as educated. The richest man in Cameroon, Dan Polo, is not that educated. So you, then it would be like maybe when you go to school too much, like Rebecca and Ong Chong would say, it's like when you're overly educated, you overly question things, and that too could be what fails you. What do you think? I think I think you, you're right on both points. Uh, I don't hire a PhD, anybody with a PhD in, in my company. Mm. I hire PhDs, not PhDs. And <laughs> the, 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 Dan Polo is very wealthy, but I think he'd be wealthier if he had some other skills that others don't have. But also, I think he, 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 you don't have to take it away from him. Mm. Uh, 
it, it comes with leadership. It comes with the kind of team you put around you. I mean, we, uh, I, we, we talk about Facebook. Zuckerberg is not a college graduate. You talk about the, the, the guys who set up uh, Uber or Instagram. They, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not uh, college graduates. You're talking about, I mean, Bill Gates, Microsoft, he's not a graduate. You know, so it's not the level of education that you have. It's not how much education that you have. It is that pressure, but also it's that ability to get up and that will to go and drive and drive and get it. You know, we, we live in a time where we, I mean, I don't want to be critical of uh, education in Cameroon, mm -hmm. but I think we train a lot of people to be philosophers and to be theocrats than having practical everyday knowledge. I just told you, I never studied oil and gas, mm -hmm. but I was in an oil and gas company. I look mm -hmm. at practical nature of things. So if someone, if someone wants to be a writer, you want to write a lot and make your mistakes and you get corrected. If mm -hmm. someone wants to be a journalist, you got to do a lot and, and get people mentor you and correct you. So I don't think education necessarily translates into wealth um, in really, really wealthy with, with business. I think it helps you. It helps improve your critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can say too much of a thing is a disease. So it, it, <laughs> you have to find that balance. Eh? Okay. You know, you have to find that balance. And then also you have to have that drive, you know. Oh, certainly. Yeah. For, so let us get into the real reason why you're here today, oil and gas. So where did, um, you've already highlighted, um, but I'm not sure where your interest to get to become involved in oil and gas originated from. Was it from what you saw in the Sudan? I think Sudan really shaped me. Sudan really shaped me. And I, you know, I went to Sudan. I was so fat. I came back so skinny. Uh, because I, I'm sorry, okay, you, you know, I, when in there, I drank at that time. I drank whiskey and beer and everything. And then you got in there, it was a very Muslim country in a, um, Sharia laws in Khartoum mm -hmm. and alcohol. So you're like, oh my goodness, you know, you sat there like, okay, here we go. And what you did was you walked out and you had uh, silence. And after about a year, I was like, okay, you know. That you couldn't have looked at nothing prepared me for what I was going to hear working with the, with the UN and some of the gender based violence issues and some of the human rights issues that were happening around Darfur or dealing with capacity building issues in South Kordofan and in Yala and El Fasha. Not, you, you, could, you couldn't go in there and live in those tiny tin roof shacks and lives in those camps and come out and be the same person. It, it, it's something that challenges your humanity to get to look and say, how do I become a problem solver? And then working with the UN, I just found myself in place with a big, big bureaucracy. And that bureaucracy was just something which I just, it just couldn't work with me. And I had to say, what do I do next? And I wanted to do more. And I felt, well, every time I wanted to do something, I had to go to somebody and say, give me a hundred dollars or give me $200 for me to do this program. And I just said, enough with that. I'm going to build something myself so that I don't have to ask for aid. I don't have to ask for people, but I would be able to finance anything I want to do. And I think that just shaped it. And I just felt, you know, I'm young, I'm hungry. I, I was single. I got nothing to lose. My girlfriend at that time had dumped me on that. They dumped me on BBM. Okay. I was dumped on BBM. So they, they, <laughs> you remember BBM from Black Bay? That's how old I am, you know. From BBM. So I was like, you know, well, I have nothing to lose. I just go ahead and I just do it. And I enjoyed it. Hmm. 
So you have um, talked about this numerous times. Every time I see your interview, I read through your book, I can feel your anger, your frustration at the fact that when you got on the oil and gas scene, there was a lot of arrogance towards the African side in the, on negotiating tables. And it felt almost like people were very timid to advocate or to ask for what they were worth. And mm -hmm. um, for you, it's one of the reasons that pushed you to be, uh, create the Centurion Law Group, which is very Pan-African in its uh, focus. And so you said, because the way you approach things is you you go for it, you go for the jugular and you, you don't spare your opponents. And obviously mm -hmm. that has meant that people will come for you because they would have to challenge you. They are big corporations, they can't have that. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in my research of you, I did come across a situation that you had recently in South Africa. And I wondered if that was people coming through for you because it, it's not like um, I'm going to go into the details, but I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Was that people coming for you? Uh, by taking you to court, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, this is this is this. You know, it's a it's a contact sport. If you don't want to get a hit, don't get involved. And you you are going to have to deal with that when you deal with a lot of big corporations. And one of the key things which we did is that we took on we took small corporations, small African corporations. One of the biggest cases we won was either taking on people who have felt discriminated in the oil and gas sector and or maybe helping a state recover billions upon billions of dollars that they should never have that they should never have lost or taking a small african company that has been exploited and of course when you, when you go through that you would always have to chance where you're going to get hit and i think that is always a great lesson for a lot of people who want to really get to work on the African scene and take on big issues. Because you are going to get hit. You are going to get really punched. But it doesn't matter what happens when you, you know, it's like a boxer. You, 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 get, you, you have to have a good chin to take a punch. But what matters is how you get up the next day. You get up the next day and be negative and be and, and everything and you forget why you do the job you do or do you get up and you keep going i mean think about it i'm a kid who has so much opportunities i am um wealthier than most other people would, would would ever dream of i have been blessed so much so let them beat it down on me but if i have to if, if you have to punch me very hard and I have to create opportunities and create more other things for people who they just they just don't have it that's fine some somebody has to carry that cross so it's 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 part of it and you have to be willing to to take that but it's what you do the next day it's how you pick up and you go forward and you go you know somebody might be responsible for you being down but they're not responsible for you not getting back up. If someone came into your studio, Pam, and uh, pulled your chair and you down, okay, that's bad. But if so, you think, if you, if I come back next week and you're still down on the on on in the floor, then that's on you. So it's it get it up. And when you are going to take on corporations, when you're going to take on big business, when you're going to take on big multinationals, and they feel like this is us. We own these resources. We own Africa. And you are some kid from nowhere, no name. Your father is not a president. Your father is not a minister. And they don't know where you come from. And you walk into that room and you say, well, I just do it. And of course, you are going to get punched. But the question you have to ask yourself is, a lot of Africa, it's like that. And a lot of people shy away because they fear, they fear they're not going to get hit. Um, some of us just think, we're just going to do it. And I, I enjoy it. I actually, for me, I enjoy it. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I got a great team, more than 100 people um, working for us. Um, they really, really do the majority of the work. I think it's very unfair to them sometimes mm -hmm. that people tend to give me a lot of credit. I think they do, I mean, I'm just a little picture 
in everything. 99% of the work, and I'm just a crazy kid who runs around um, laughing or trying to eat or trying to do something stupid around, but they do the, they do the majority, and I stand, for, stand by them. I always stand by my team because I felt, yeah, we have built a group of Africans uh -huh. that they, they dream about this continent and they want to change things. Uh -huh. So if you, so my job is sometimes like a coach to create a space for them to walk. Create a space. Somebody has to do that. Okay. Well, good job to the Centurion team. <laughs> um, so talking about people who feel very entitled, as in I own you, um, in, in your book, you also elucidate about what happened with Elf. <laughs> um, it was quite shocking. I mean, I'd read a little bit about it. I'd seen a, a, snap, a snippet of a, of a documentary about what had happened and actually, there was a minister from the Congo at the time, the Republic of Congo, who was saying there was a time that the money they got from Elf was only 20,000 francs uh, from the oil money. And they told them that the crude oil was a very low grade. And because most African countries didn't have the technology to know how much oil was being tapped. Um, so it, it was after uh, the investigation that started with by an American, a disgruntled American businessman against a French businessman, if I'm not confusing it, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of un, un, unraveled all that history. So imagine a country such as the Republic of Congo for maybe more than, um, you know, 15 years, oil is being taken out of your country and you have no idea how much oil it is. And you're getting, you know, less than one. In fact, less next to nothing for your oil because you don't have the, the capability. So my question is, and I'm hoping that this has changed uh, because you also updated um, for the Ghana experience where in 20, 2011, if I'm not mistaken, the oil wasn't pumping correctly or the meter had a problem. And so there was this, uh, uh, the meter that actually, you know, uh, counts the number of barrels that leave the floor. Um, so the citizens had to lobby to get the government to change that immediately. So uh, please, can you tell us if other African countries have made an effort to ensure that this is not the case, otherwise we'll have had palpitations? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think some have made an effort. A lot, a lot has changed in the industry. I yeah. think one of the big things which I'm very proud of, it was that of uh, it was big British Gas signed with Equatorial Guinea, for example, on their LNG plan, on their gas. And it, Pam, you know, what, what they did was they told the government that they're going to sell the gas at, you know, not to get into, take into too much technical terms, mm -hmm. at little for about 75 cents in the US. That's the contract, right? And then nothing was ever sold on the Henry Hawk price, which is based out of Houston. They sold the gas on the Asian index because in China and Japan, they need more, more gas for the economy. Mm -hmm. So that gas was actually sold for $4. So they were making, three. just imagine, they were making 325 cents a liter. Um, sorry, $3.25. Mm -hmm. And now the, the government has to share on that 75 cents, they take maybe about 50 cents, the government get 20, 25 cents. So you get this company, which is quote unquote, a marketing company, doesn't own anything. They come in and they're making it already about 300, about $3.25 um, um, and you're making 25 cents. How fair is that? Just because of, so we took on that case, got it, it one, changed it, and it became fair. But that tells you a lot of what African states have gone True, but sometimes we can't blame them. Okay, it's it, it's it's up to us to really um, stand up and sit up, and that's why sometimes I, I wrote my book about negotiations. Mm -hmm. You got your stuff. You got to work on your stuff. You can't expect that when you get on that table, the other guy is just going to be fair, or he's just going to um, lie down and say, "Well, let's just do a contract that works." Okay, no, you have to really get in there. First of all, you got to know what you want. You got to pay your home. How many times do you know or have you seen African delegations that fly out and to, into countries that when they arrive, some of them don't even show up to the table. Some of them don't, don't even read their material. And some of them 
they just happy to have a nice ticket to stay in that nice hotel, but they're not really getting the stuff done. Mm -hmm. And that it's some, it comes really down with what and how you want to get to negotiate and the results that you want to get. And if you really get down to it, you can get those results. It's not so hard because, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, when I was in Sunday school, they taught me of these temptations where you take where they, where where Jesus said to David, "Get behind me, Satan." You know, so you have to get to that point where you say, "You know, I'm going to resist," because sometimes it's it's all about facts. You got to show people facts, and we don't. I, I mean, I, I hate to say this, we just don't pay attention in our stuff. You know, we just don't pay attention in our stuff because I've been to negotiations where we show up late. We have not read, and those things really, really affect how you do, and also planning, planning. You know, you get into an, on the table and you ask the other guy for the contract. I mean, if, when I get into on, on the table and the, the other side is asking for the contract, I know he hasn't read it because if you had read it, you would have a copy. <laughs> you know, if you asked me on the negotiating table for a copy of the contract and this guy thinks he's an expert and everything, but you have Western corporations where they have a finance team, economic teams, geological teams, legal teams, actuaries, every part of it, they have a whole team on that. And you think three of you guys who haven't read the contract will walk in there and match them. We're doing a disservice to our nation. We're doing a disservice to our continent. And I really hope we change that. And I, slowly in some countries are changing that, like Senegal and so, some other countries are, are doing a better job and I hope it, it improves. Yeah. So wh why aren't the governments, are, because surely governments have been doing these contracts for a very long period of time. And so you would know that these are the kinds of skills you need. Is it that we lack them? Why don't we have those people at negotiating tables? Why aren't they consulted? I don't think I don't think it's an issue of lack. I I I, I turn to not understand the politics sometimes, and I think I get a little bit. Uh, that's why I say I'm get I'm I'm too old. I get a little naive. But I think sometimes you have a, a place where you come with people who get to feel that they want to um, they want to protect their territory. And they want to really just stick to what they have and not do more. Mm -hmm. The real thing you got to ask yourself is in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in Germany or in France, they are well advanced countries. They look at people from everywhere and they say, help us take us to the next level. These same people can't find themselves doing well or doing anything in their country of origin. Take, for example, many Africans um, don't even feel welcome at home mm -hmm. and even get stuff done at home. And I, think, I don't want to sound very controversial, but the role of the diaspora has to be appreciated more in Africa and in our countries. When we look at people whom we, they, they're part of us and they have acquired certain skill sets mm -hmm. in a diaspora mm -hmm. and in foreign surgeons. Mm -hmm. We should appreciate that and not demonize that. We should see them as people who are going to really help shape our countries, help to build different things and bring a different mix. Rather than being, rather than we sitting back in Africa and feeling these people are a threat to our own little fiefdoms. I think that's what's in ambition. It's, it, we, 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 it speaks very low of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, if, if we try to use, because the skills are there, if we try, just take for example Cameroon. I mean, I have met so many Cameroonians who are so bright, they have done so well in many, many different, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in France, in Germany, and they could they could do it. They could do a darn good job in really improving some of the uh, some of some of the things in the country. And I think 
we, we have to start appreciating that and we have to seize that opportunity and embrace it. No, definitely, um, definitely. So, I mean, <laughs> looking on the bright side, you, 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 well, for those who haven't read the books, but I'll keep referring to the books because that's where I've seen examples of really good examples uh, of where things are working properly. Um, so you already mentioned Senegal of where things have worked well, where the citizens were included. And um, Ghana too was a very interesting one for me. So um, there might be politics on the side, but should, you know, we would think to ourselves, these are people you read, um, we don't need to take 25 years like Norway did to build a, a sovereign fund for the country. So Ghana just copied that and they were able to create their own sovereign fund in 23 days. Um, they didn't have to wait 25 years for that to happen. And so we would ask ourselves, we've had Sonara for this number of years, like, what are we doing with the oil there? We don't even know what's going on with that oil in, in Sonara. So I have a, just a tie to a question here from uh, Emmanuel Four. He's, he, he's saying he's appreciating you for being a trailblazer, doing an amazing job in Africa. But he wants to know how receptive the Cameroon government has been to your skills and knowledge. And I think, you know, Sonara can actually make good use of it. You're trying to get me in trouble, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> We're all very nice here. <laughs> well, I, I, I love my country. Uh, like I told you, I'm Cameroonian to the core. I would always be Cameroonian. Um, I've never had a call from the Cameroonian government um, to be part of the energy sector. And it doesn't bother me because uh, I, I think I have been well respected um, in many African countries. I, I would say at least 25 African heads of states and the ministers or prime ministers would reach out from time to time. Sometimes it's just to have a conversation about the energy sector. Sometimes it's to actually do work for their states and a lot of African companies and they would do um, Cameroon is a very, very interesting country. And uh, I think when it comes into resources and you look at issues around Sonora, I think uh, a refinery is key in the country, but right now the refinery doesn't exist anymore. They're importing a lot of the products. I think the, but we have to go beyond the refinery. You have to really look at, um, there is great potential for gas in Cameroon. And there's something you must pay attention very carefully in that country. Um, uh, a lot of people, energy poverty is real. A lot of people in the country do not have lights. And we have to get back to the basic. A lot of people do not know what it means. And you can never get manufacturing and create more jobs and develop the country when you don't have power. You cannot run an industry with, the, with generators. So um, power and everything is really key. So being able to drive a gas economy in the country, it's key. Being able, and again, it's just like what I talked about, tapping into the diaspora to really help reshape that. i give an example. I do a lot of work for a lot of Nigerian uh, marginal oil producers and Nigerian oil companies. A big amount of my uh, revenue comes from marginal producers in Nigeria and you name it, they, um, they're good friends and I, we advise them a lot because they did one thing. They said, we'll create an industry. We'll give our people who understand energy to get a chance in them of creating small scale petroleum um, projects and blocks and everything. So you have a lot of Nigerian billionaires. So that created a lot of Nigerian billionaires and a lot of Nigerians who are really part of the industry and they're doing well and some of them are expanding outside Nigeria. There's no reason we can create that. Cameroon's oil and gas production has not increased. It has actually declined and it continues to decline and it continues to decline. I hope that uh, um, the leadership would, 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 would deem it necessary to really take pay conscious attention on that and, but also how you share natural resource, the, the revenue that comes out of natural resources, it really plays a key role in solving um, ongoing disputes um, and ongoing issues. Give an example, in Ghana, 
some of the things they did, which um, I was lucky to have um, been an advisor to the Ghanaian government when they created a lot of their petroleum regulations and, and, and policies, is we, is we said, engage the communities. Where you find the oil, engage the communities. Let the people whom oil is found in their backyard feel that this industry is also part of them. So they can be set aside for jobs, they could be set aside for opportunities, they could be really, really training programs and health programs, make sure that they know that our community is getting some resources, but we are also benefiting. Not that our community is getting resources, but somebody else is getting is getting that. So that helps resolve a lot of um, local disputes that you find. So I think a lot, a lot can be done in Cameroon. I hope a lot will be done. And uh, I think it's uh, like we say, we'll be watching you, Pam, to tell us how to get involved. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it would seem that, you know, law is very central to the oil and gas industry to ensure that negotiations are win-win, which you've already elucidated on for the partners when deals are brokered. So uh, we've talked about the work that Centurion Law Group is doing with its Pan-African outlook, and you've already uh, highlighted, you know, some of the African countries that you've worked with. And um, you've also sealed some of the biggest, uh, largest oil and gas deals to date in sub-Saharan Africa. So how successful have you been in ensuring that the deals are representative, not only of the government and companies involved, but of the ordinary citizens in those countries? I mean, Ghana aside. I think it's, it's, it's an issue where, um, you know, this is where, where people hate lawyers. You become <laughs> at gun, whoever hires me. You know, um, I was very, I've been very proud of the work that we've done. Um, I give example, we, we, uh, we've worked with so many, so many, so many big projects. When governments have hired us, you do your best. There is one thing which you have an ethical responsibility to doing the best for your client. And, but also you have a moral responsibility sometimes to try to influence um, the right thing. So for example, if I am advising a client, I would, there is nothing, the client comes from the United States and he's saying, let's not pay attention about these responsibilities to local communities. Okay. I'm the kind of guy who will say no, because I'm thinking 10 years, I'm thinking 20 years, I'm thinking 30 years. I said, you are going to invest in local communities because if you do, you are going to be in business in 10, 20 years and you'll, you'll prevent you from getting in trouble in those communities. Okay. I'm at a stage in my career where I have a big voice and I can impose some, some conditions on the table to, for me to come to the table. If you don't want, that's fine, I'll walk away from the deal. Mm -hmm. But you might not sign the deal, and I, and I think and I think that I am blessed. Many people have that chance. I'm blessed that I can be in the table and I can tell some people I'm not going to do that. You know, I I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose I wouldn't lose any sleep. My staff mm -hmm. would be okay, and our team would be okay. The biggest thing we have to worry a lot is being able not just being on the table, but being able to shape it. But it's also an education process. It's kind of like when I when I have a principal position where I get invited to a lot of conferences, and I decided to say I would not I would not speak at a conference where you don't have participation of women in it. Mm -hmm. as, as I stand, if I'm going to go into a panel, I said if you don't have women being part of it, you you you, you I'm not going to do it. And people might say, well, that's some grandstanding, and what are you trying to do? I said, well, you know. I was raised by a woman. I I have a daughter. I have an obligation to do something bigger than my own personal interest. And if I have that voice where I can shape my own little industry where I am, you have to do it. And I think that's what some of us who have the possibility and an opening to be in certain rooms where a lot of people can be, you have to use that voice to really drive the wind to blow towards justice. Indeed. So good governance is essential to successful management of oil and gas resources. However, we've seen that when it comes to structuring, negotiating and implementing the laws, 
uh, the policy framework sometimes do not respond to the needs of the people. Um, in your book, Big Barrels, African Oil and Gas and the Quest for Prosperity, you give the Tanzania example where the government realized that to be successful, they could not go over uh, the people, otherwise unrest would ensue. So a key component um, from what your book elicits, it's realizing the dreams of a developing Africa using natural resources. And that obviously hinges on good governance. So it seems obvious, but application is not. So why is this why is this not always the case? Where did we go wrong? There's too much money in the game. That's where we went wrong. There is too much money, there's too much ego, and there's too much men, there are too many men who know nothing running around the place. And I think that the more women you have in the industry, the industry it is. And also, you, you will find less governance issues. You are dealing with so much money, so much money that most of us would never have never seen, would never dream of, and people don't even see. And when you you have to determine the kind of person you are. When you stand up and you say no, you are going to get like you. Oh, you're going to get hit. You're going to get hit so hard. And, you know, these guys, they call you, they tell you, we're going to put you out of business. We are going to finish you. So a, a, a big part of it is that you have African nations that are under huge amounts of pressure. If you don't sign this contract, if you don't agree to these terms, we will stop giving you development aid. And, you know, we like development aid in Africa. <laughs> you know, we would stop, we would cancel visas. We would do this. And they, these, some of the multinational corporations have so much power. And then also the other, the other part is that you have to make a persuasive case. And how do you stop that? You build a local industry. When you build a local industry, your people run the show, not governments. The issue is that when governments become sole engines and the sole um, entities that generate investment, then you have a problem. Because most people, I mean, we're talking about Cameroon, most people don't trust, don't trust bureaucrats to really be able to do, to do this. They, felt, they feel bureaucrats have not really done a, a great job. So when you build a local industry, you have business to business negotiation, you create value in the economies and then you, 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 you open yourself up for real negotiations and real contracts. Governance is a key issue in the oil and gas sector and in the, in, 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 in the entire natural resource sector. Corruption is a key issue in, 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 in this sector. But you got to look at both sides. I always say it's not one side that is corrupt. All sides are corrupt in, in, in this. You have to look at discrimination, you know, I always talk about women in, in, in the energy sector. Most men don't know what it takes for a woman to work in the energy sector. Most men don't understand it. it because I mean, most of our, it, 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 when we talk about governance, sometimes we just talk about money. We don't know, we don't even pay attention to sexual harassment rules in, in, in corporations. We don't take pay attention to some of the, the comments and some of the language and the slight things that we would say or do in work environments and that we would think that that's okay. That's not okay. And you know, so you, and even if we behave a certain way, there are no consequences. And that impurity, it really, it really eats up to the soul of what any corporation that you work in or the industry. And I think we need to pay attention to that and we, we, we tend, and if you don't have government action really backing that and really seriously, it tends to affect and it trickles down into, into corporate governance and yeah. good and governance within, within the sector. So it's not just about, oh, this guy being fair and everything. It's how we look at the entire fairness, uh, uh, fairness regime within the industry. And I think the natural resource industry still has to do a, a lot, a lot. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. And I lead the African Union Chamber. We put ourselves to blame sometimes on that. We try, we try to take that head on. It's not an easy conversation for me sometimes with all the executives or with yeah. government 
because they feel like you're not getting what you want. So you, you, you're like a referee that never wins, but we yeah. got to keep the dialogue going and we got to keep the conversation going. Yeah, indeed. So the environment has suffered heavy casualties to uh, the business of oil and gas. Nigeria's Niger Delta, as we've seen, has seen a massive amount of destruction of a marine ecosystem, which is not limited to the Calabaria Islands uh, due to oil spillage, oil bunkering and uh, gas fl uh, flaring. Uh, we saw the killing of the Ogoni activists in 1995. But in your book, Big Barrels, you give a surprising example of Gabon, which has maintained a natural forest and taken drastic measures to protect our environment, not strangely due to oil, but as a result of it. So can you tell us a bit more about that and why more efforts are not made against environmental degradation when carrying out oil and gas activities? It comes with political will and leadership. Political will and leadership has to be there when it comes to the environment. I mean, you can't, you can't really look at the world we live in and where we live right now and not pay attention. Climate change is real. Climate change is something that we all must pay attention to. But there are communities like in the Ogoni communities in Nigeria and a lot of communities around Africa that nobody is talking about. We need to pay attention to that. But when, I mean, President Bongo, for whether you like him or not, he just made it an issue and he said, we are going to pay attention to the environment. Mm -hmm. And he did not have the skills in Gabon, but he was able to bring in partners, bring in experts. I mean, you even have Cameroonians working there on environmental issues. And when you and they have done an amazing job in in, in on the on, on the environment. And you know what? You still have oil and, um, oil and gas exploration there, but the environment is getting better and better. And I think that we have to be good stewards of our, of our environment, and we only are going to benefit if we really have poly but you need political will because corporations sometimes, they want to drill, they mm -hmm. want to break, and they want to go. Mm -hmm. But it's up to you, and it's up to us to say, we want to make sure that the are better than we met it. Indeed, political will, very essential. So um, it, it has become very difficult not to link oil to the economy of most African countries. So some countries have become very dependent on oil revenue for their economies. This is bad for when the price of oil falls, then the country's GDP plummets alongside that. Uh, so you, you talked a lot about the declaration of cooperation by OPEC countries in your new book, Billions at Play. Um, so firstly, what is the declaration of cooperation about? The declaration of cooperation, you know, you had an OPEC, an OPEC member states, but a lot of oil is being produced by non-OPEC member states. So they decided all to say, well, Russia, which is a big producer, and other small countries like uh, Mexico, South Sudan, Kazakhstan, who are not OPEC countries, say, we'll come together, we'll join with OPEC and try to find ways to stabilize the market because if their prices are too low, it's bad for developing economies and for the producers. If it's too high, it's bad for consumers. So you got to find a middle ground. And but you, you, need, you need to have a big tent. You know, you don't succeed in this thing by having a small tent. You need to expand your tent. And I think in, in essence, they came together to say, we are going to create an industry. We are going to create some kind of corporation to make sure that we work, to make sure that market forces always work in the industry. And it's working, but sometimes like in any family, they would have their quarrels and they would have their fights. And you could see with the recent um, oil price crash and part of the COVID-19 also had an effect on it. And they, they're trying, I mean, I've been lucky to have been an advisor to OPEC and uh, been in a lot of their negotiations and in, in most of the OPEC meetings, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge to be right in there trying to twist arms and trying to find ways to make this work. But it's also, it's also a blessing to just be in that room to, with uh, all the key players in the sector looking for a solution. And I think for a kid from Manfe, that is uh, that's a journey and you, you, you feel blessed.
Okay, just so I just want to give our viewers a bit of background. So OPEC are all producing con uh, countries. They were first of all uh, mostly was for Middle East. Uh, there were nine, is it nine or twelve Middle Eastern countries that started OPEC. Mm -hmm. And in order to become a member of OPEC, you had to be producing five hundred barrels of oil per day uh, to become a member. But you know, over time, um, as the years have gone by, most of the oil wells in the Middle East are drying out, and um, America is like produces eighty percent of the oil in the world, if I'm not mistaken. And so America too has gotten very uh, uh, powerful compared to the OPEC countries. So in order to shore up their power, they're now including other African countries that don't produce as much as 500 barrels of oil per day into the club, just so that they can have more political clout to be able to negotiate deals on their behalf. So you've talked about COVID-19, and I also wanted to highlight the NOPEC that President Donald Trump was trying to pass across so that foreign entities can't sell oil in America. It would be illegal, right? And it's a funny thing because in most OPEC countries, the oil is actually managed by the state. But in America, oil is produced by private enterprise. So how is yes. that going? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, President Trump is uh, an interesting character. Uh, he, he, he used to be a very, very um, um, protagonist of, of OPEC, didn't like OPEC a lot. But I think recently we have found a lot of love from President Trump. He's been very supportive of what um, we do at OPEC because at the end, you know, sometimes in the presidency shapes you, it educates you. And I think he got to realize that the oil industry, a big part of it had to shape with America. Mm -hmm. The American oil sector in states like Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, the Pennsylvania as well, they really, depend a lot of the, on the oil and gas resources. So no PEC bill was going to bring antitrust lawsuit, lawsuits into OPEC member states because oil prices were going to be very high and, 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 and in, in, in that. But I think what you are seeing right now, they, 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 that has changed. And I think it spoke very low about America and American community and the sense where people who Live, um, Americans could really should really learn how to compete, but if yeah. you all these African countries and American countries, what would happen is that you would end up still hitting yourself, you know, because the biggest producers um, in the Middle East and Africa are American companies, the service companies, you know, they hire a lot of Americans, Baker Hughes, Halliburton, Weatherford and all of that, it's, it's always Americans being part of that. So it was going to be counterproductive. We did a lot of lobbying with the United States government. I'm happy it worked out very well, but you got to keep your eyes open. You got to find a way to work with um, the Americans. The, one of the things we in Africa have to learn also is that the shield revolution in America has been amazing. They break it up, give Americans an opportunity for them to build and these young people, they went out there with their own skills and they just, America went from producing 8 million barrels to 12 to 13 million barrels a day right now. And they're the largest producer in the world. They produce more oil than Russia, produce more oil than Saudi Arabia, and they produce more oil than the entire African continent. So we have, so, so sometimes I'm one of those who say, Rather than look and criticize what someone is doing, look at what they're doing right. Look at how their journey, look at how they got there in spite of all the adversity and all the problems they face and learn from them, interact with them. I think I, I, I always tell a lot of my African brothers and Cameroonians as well to say, look at how they did it and what can you learn and what can you copy from them and change that. So don't spend time hating, spend time and doing. Okay. So apart from Ghana, which has ensured diversity in um, her economy, we hope that Senegal will take a leave out of her book. What can African countries do to avoid this uh, dependence of, of um, on oil? Um, so, Because we've been doing this for so long. So how do the countries that have been so dependent on oil learn to diversify their economy? Because I was quite happy that, uh, you know, oil only accounts for like about 9% of Ghana's economy, which is really good. But we do know that with some countries, it's up to 90%. So without oil, they're yeah. dead. Well, the, the question you've got to ask yourself is that the largest consumers of oil 
China, India, what do they do with all the oil and the gas from Africa? Hmm. That's what that's that's where you need to start, Pam. And you just ask yourself that question: What did they do with our oil and with our gas when they buy? It? You know, they buy this oil and this gas. They create power industries. Mm -hmm. They manufacturing in the manufacturing industries and all the factories, and they manufacture goods, and then they sell the goods back to Africa. Huh. So, the question is so the question is that you got to start changing so you, you got to change your outlook and you got to look at it and say if we use our gas I, I i was talking to my good friends out of nigeria the other day yeah the gas that nigeria is flaring can power at least 50 to 60 percent of the continent hmm. in the air all right so if you look at Nigeria, Cameroon, Ghana, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Congo, all these countries, they got gas that's been flared. If you capture the gas that's been flared, you would make sure mom and dad, they have a light 24 seven. So like I told you before, you can't run industries with generators. So first, we need to use our natural resources to power Africa. When you power Africa, you create jobs, you create factories, you create industries, you start, you start receiving economic growth, economic empowerment, people, people start feeling better, and then you start having infrastructure development. And with that kind of infrastructure development, we stop asking for aid. We stop running to Europe and America every time. And then we, we, it avoids civil crises and civil wars and civil strife in that country because people are seeing economic prosperity. You know, mm -hmm. I always, people fight because they're hungry. You know, people fight because they don't see their, their situation in their communities changing. So that is what we need, to start, we need to start looking at. We have to have a new outlook change. We cannot just see ourselves as people who collect rent for our resources. We basically rent our resources to man, man, multinational corporations. We ship our resources to China. But we need to start taking our gas, our oil, and put, use it right into Africa. Develop refineries and make sure that those refineries work. Develop gas plants and make sure that we tend those gas plants and work into, into power plants. Look at Cameroon, for example. In Crete or in Limbe, you can, you can pipe gas into that create a petrochemical facility around there that would do urea, ammonia, NPK, fertilizer plants. And right next to it, you have your CDC plantations. You have all the kind of uh, um, tea plantations on, in, the, in the entire area. You will be able to provide fertilizer that would create a big agricultural industry and even do more. But then you only a few kilometers you, have to, you don't have to worry about shipping a lot of what you get out of that fertilizer and out of other petrochemical facilities and simply shipping the raw products into, into Asia. You have a 200 million market in Nigeria. So you are going to see that really happen, but also pay attention to the fact that the entire European Union is 300 million. Right next to you is a 200 million market. So you can really be able to use your resources to do something that really works for everybody. And then by so doing, you create jobs, you stimulate the local economy, you really get young people getting out of universities and colleges to get jobs and do better. But then at the end of the day, you are really, really going to really see that these economies are really living up to the expectations of the people and you wouldn't see us complain about the natural resource sector. We need, it's not, I don't think we need to wait on someone from Europe to do it. We have to do it ourselves. And I do see around Africa, in Senegal, they're trying to implement that. They're trying to really make sure that they have a balanced energy mix. South Africa is looking a lot on that. You know, you, you've seen a lot of those discussions happening in, in Tanzania. And you've seen Ghana is already moving ahead of that. And I hope a lot of Central African countries can do more to really ensure that, and so that we don't just be rent and royalty collectors, but we actually those who develop our, our natural resources to serve our people. Indeed.
I take it you like Dambisa Moyo. I do like I do like a lot of her works. I think it's it's uh we we need to move away from the eight paradigm because I think anytime when you you start having personal responsibility, personal discipline, you know, it's not enough that we we always go in day in day out and think we are going to bed. Hmm. People don't like beggars for a long time, okay. you know. <laughs> we have enough. We have enough to be able to turn it around and everything. And you know, I tell you something. I go a lot around Africa, and even with Cameroon, you have a lot of young people that they just so smart. They have so much ideas. The ingenuity. They can really do a lot more than than we are expecting. If we create the environment and we give them the opportunity. Look at Cameroon. You had in uh, Boya, you had the Silicon, uh, what do you call it, Silicon Mountain. Okay. Yeah. Whoever thought they could create a tech hub like that, that could be as brilliant as anything that you find. And they could, I mean, you had Google coding, um, you got a young man out of Cameroon. That's and great. so you, 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 you have to look at the environment. The, that enabling environment is key. When you an environment, you see a lot of young people coming out of in, in tech hubs and everything. So you're talking about energy. We going, we seen a time of energy transition and climate change. You need to ask yourself, who are those that are going to be guiding that? Are we going to? I had a debate with a professor from Northern Ireland the other day. He was talking about well, Europe should give Africa the money to do climate change. So we going to beg for technology. We are going to beg for everything. But I, I mean, Pam, you know, when, when, when you give me technology, you own the patents, you own the copyrights. And so any day I don't do what you want, you just cut me off. You know, okay. the guy who gives you, who, 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 who gives you food. So, yeah. so I think we have a chance where we could have young people be able to really drive that growth that it comes into renewables or you, you looking at different alternative energy just that we need to create legislation or you need to create some kind of environment that makes it really work because right now you can do a solar or wind technology plant in most african countries it's just, mm -hmm. it's not commercial everybody talks about solar wind um, climate change and all of that try one of those hubs in africa it is not commercial so who is going to pay their money to do something that's not commercial? It just wouldn't work because it's too expensive when it compared to hydro or gas with power. But at the end of the day, Africans don't have much time for to discriminate which is better or not. They just want to see lights. So mm -hmm. if you bring lights, if you can bring in, if you can power industries, people have jobs, they are happier. Okay. So um, you quoted a World Bank report in your book, Big Barrels, as does. Countries with better policy frameworks exhibit higher efficiency of investment. So using finances generated from natural resources to develop infrastructure is an important investment that most countries need um, to safeguard their economies and secure the future of generations. I mean, you've already talked around this, actually, and how we could use these resources to trans to transform Africa. So I was, I was impressed with how Ghana, through the consult uh, consultative process, which uh, in some ways it facilitated what all was discovered in the country, created the Ghana Stabilization Fund and the Ghana Heritage Fund, which cannot be accessed for a period of like 15 years to guarantee mm -hmm. that generations enjoy the profits of oil production. This is unprecedented on, on the continent. So will you advise other African other Africans take an example from Ghana? If yes, is it possible for all the context? Because some people have already been in this business um, uh, uh, business of oil and gas for, for so many years. I would say yes. I mean, just think about it. If you take 15% of what you have and you save it for future generations, and you say, we would not have access to it for 15 years or 30 years or more. That already tells you that you have people in leadership and politicians thinking about the long term of the country. They, 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 it's not a bad idea to say you create these sovereign, the sovereign funds 
and you don't you, 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 and you prepare it for the future because at the end of the day, these resources are finite resources uh -huh. coming back. Uh -huh. So you are cheating down on future generations. So if you get these resources, you you say, okay, we need to develop, we need to do some stuff right now. But it's just like, you know, just get back home. Just like what you do, you know, I, I, I get my little salary from my job. So I put I put something on the side for in my business account and say, this is for the future. If I don't have a job or if I don't have something, I'm, my wife and me will manage this for long term and we'll be okay. Why can't a nation do that with its natural resources, with, with its natural resources and say, we are making billions of dollars coming in from natural resources. Let's just keep 10, 15, 20% for on the side, but also let's put about 5% for education, youth empowerment, and for the communities that have these resources so that we can still try to empower them and prevent that. To basically have all of that money come into a national pool and then the politicians play around with it. And what happens, you create discontent within the entire structure of, of in, in, in the country. And so for long term, you see the government's always broke. They don't have any kind of backing because you have no planning. And when you have no planning, it becomes, it really hurts the social fabric of the country and wherever you want to be. So we need to be very um, careful how we really govern this industry. I would urge more, more countries to do what Ghana has done. I think it's working. And I think in the past people would say, well, NJ, you know, that's what happens to um, European countries and white people and everything. To save and think about the future is not a white thing. It, it's a human thing. So I, I don't I don't buy into that, that that nonsense that Africans can't do something and this is left for white people. That's just for me that, that's just that's just nonsense. That's stupidity. And when well, people that's very true and I, 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 <laughs> my book. I was very happy to see that you highlighted in your book um that you know Equatorial Guinea actually holds almost no public debt. <laughs> They do. They, they have no public debt. And that's, that's, that's their generation. Really nobody in Equatorial Guinea owes anyone around the world anything. Like, they're but that's the thing. We, and, and, and I think it's something that, you know, I told in the beginning that I'm old, but that's something that we have to really think about what we're living to young people in their 10, in their 20s, and their 30s. The debt that we take in, what I just the, the, the huge number of debt we're taking from China, the huge number of debt we're taking from Western countries, we are going to suffocate these young people that every time we always say the youth are the future of the country and the youth, they, this belongs to them. What kind of country are we trying, again, are we trying to leave for them? Or what kind of Africa are we trying to leave for, for them when we just suffocate them with so much debt because we're not within our means we keep borrowing against the natural resources and spending and then they, it's just spend 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 but we're not even we, we i mean sometimes you say you would borrow to do a business we're not even we're boring to spend we're not even trying to say we'll borrow to build um refineries and build fertilizer plants and build different kind of job creating projects and everything and then we borrow to corrupt. I don't think it makes sense. We need to change our, our, our approach to this because it is going to hurt future generations. And I think 20, 30 years from now, a lot of young people are going to be very, very angry. They're already angry right now. You know, exactly. yeah. they're going to be angry and, with what they see. Yeah, and talking about debt, I was going to ask you about these um, uh, oil loans, oil-backed loans, um, because I see that in Ghana, the public were very strong to, to ensure that the government doesn't take oil-backed loans because they've had issues with this and that's what they got into trouble and started having some fiscal troubles. Um, so how do you, um, in your ad advising African governments, how do you advise them to, to put in that clause to stop taking oil-backed loans? They can't put in a clause because it's like... Uh... It's, it's, it's like a, a lender. Somebody is sending out there saying, I have $200 million to give you. 
but you will have to sign off your oil for the next six months or one year. And the government takes the money. And before you realize there are new cars on the street uh, for members of parliament, the new cars for directors, and they spend the 200 million in one month. Mm. And then next, the next guy. And I think those are all fiscal frameworks where you live within your means. You know, every family you live within their means. And I think that that's, it's, it's, this, this is, this is, you know, it's not just oil, it's whether you have gold or whether you have diamonds. We have to use our resources wisely. And now you ask the question, why went to natural resources? You start seeing that whatever you do with natural resources tends to affect the entire economic economic uh, framework in the country and mm -hmm. all all set all facets of the economy has to do with the, with the, with the natural resource sector so we have these oil back loans they back it's better you trade your oil and on a tender whoever mm -hmm. pays the most gets i mean monopoly is never a good thing whenever you have monopolies and there is no competition then mm -hmm. you you're in trouble mm -hmm. okay so <laughs> In big barrels, you pointed out that Sonango, um, the, the Angola the National Oil Company, uh, frustrates most uh, Western or American oil companies when it comes to doing business because this is not down to their operation practice, but the differences in principles, as in uh, Sonango negotiators are very hard. Um, they're very good at that. So uh, I was wondering how we could teach other Africans working working in governments to ask for what they're worth apologetically in the way that Angolans have mastered, and because you already highlighted that. I think it, 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 again it comes with political will. The leaders have to back you. Okay. I've I've, I've seen some negotiations where I go in and. I'm pushing for to get some kind of result. And then you get a call at night and say, drop it. You well, know? Why? Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, don't you ask, like, why this is a good deal? It's a political decision. So you 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 you, you get frustrated, but again, mm -hmm. client is the boss, mm -hmm. the client is the key, mm -hmm. and you say that. What what we must know, and we start to privatize and create more opportunities for citizens. Mm -hmm. You go see more. Mm -hmm. I think thirty of your questions have come with why the government doesn't negotiate better, why the this, and why the government doesn't do this. I think to fill that politicians are the best equipped to negotiate our lives. I think most Africans have given hope, given up hope on that. Mm -hmm. Africans believe that politicians can really lead them to anywhere. Yeah. I think a lot has to come out of um, the private sector, being able to drive things and drive growth and drive what has to be done. And I think that is going to be a process that you're going to find coming around the African continent. And leaders who understand that have been able really transform the entire, the economies on that. You've seen, you've seen, um, again, Nigeria has a lot of problems, mm -hmm. but you've seen how they have been able to transform their energy sector. So you have about 30 Nigerian companies producing oil. Mm -hmm. I can't say the same. If you look at Cameroon, I don't see one Cameroon company producing oil. I don't see one in Gabon, I don't see one in Congo. And, and I don't see one in, 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 even in Equatorial Guinea, I don't see one in Sao Tome, I don't see one in the DRC. So where you have free um, um, private enterprise um, working, it creates so much possibility for people to really drive this growth and drive ingenuity and find ways to be cost effective. Because, you know, we quit to give to the Western investor Sometimes we say they have money, but they have no money. Mm. We give them the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Then Pam or John or Ray, when they come in, or Verna, if they come in and they say, we want to take on this opportunity. We, we have to start loving our own. We have to start creating a path for our own people to be part of developing our own economies. And that doesn't mean that you, we shouldn't do it with 
Western partners or Asian partners, they should be part of it. But you, you, you cannot just say, you know, I have these guys coming from Paris or from London. I'm just going to work with them only. You should include your people because it, would, it, it beats for a long term success. But I just I, I find that there is a huge disparity in how Anglophone Africa operates in terms of business and Francophone Africa. Why is that? Is that the French thing like Elf still being there and uh, Anglophone Africa being a bit more okay? We're very slightly more democratic and a bit more engaged with the people compared to France. I think it comes with the tradition of how you um, you engage in your outlook and in business. I. I, I rough a lot of feathers because uh, I came with a very um, American outlook in getting into business, getting into oil, and a lot of people just said, you know, you be the, you you've been a little too brash, and you you will not wait your time, and you know, I mean, I'm talking to you right now. I don't have a suit and tie. I wear cowboy boots, mm -hmm. and. You know, I, I do, I do, I, 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 I you know. Well, then you're and then you're real oil. <laughs> I wear cowboy boots and I walk there and, you know, I talk in a colorful way sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't know Madame, Mademoiselle, Monsieur and all those pleasantries, you yeah. know. <laughs> I think you, 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 you turn to see, it's a different kind of thing because for me, like, don't waste my time. Let's get let's let let let's get things let's get things going, and yeah. I think that those traditions are there, mm -hmm. and it really determine the outlook on how business has been done and how people have appreciated how it has been. I think when you have a fusion of both, mm -hmm. it's very very helpful. There is strength in diversity. Mm -hmm. However, when it, it's up to us on how to engage that. And how dynamic we do that. Some people, I um, have some friends whom I always say they try too hard mm -hmm. to be as democratic as their friends are, yeah. and people try too hard to be as down to earth as the Anglophones are. Yeah. So they find that happy mix and, and get things going. But you know, we're competing in a business environment, and let's be very, very honest about this. The dollars you're competing for is not just shaped for Africa. Mm -hmm. it, for example, the oil industry. Mm -hmm. Guyana, nobody ever thought Guyana would be would find you know more than two billion barrels of petrol right now. Mm -hmm. Because of that, before when you look at oil, it was always um, Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Nigeria producing. Now you're seeing massive, massive gas discoveries. In Mozambique, mm -hmm. bigger than, than, than Cameroon, Nigeria, and all of them combined, wow. you see massive gas discoveries in in uh, Tanzania, massive in Senegal, Mauritania. So you, you know the new kids in the block are actually kicking some butt. Mm -hmm. So you know the old arrogance of how we do things, where you go into an office in in most of our uh, of our of our lovely bureaucratic um, Central African countries and they keep waiting for 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 six hours to meet somebody and everything. I mean sometimes you talk about um, why I don't do business in a certain country. Mm. I'll go there and they'll keep me waiting for three, four days to see um, an inspector. Mm. When I fly in a different country and I'll meet with either the head of state or the minister the same day or meet the CEO the same day of a big multinational corporation, exactly. but back home, and then you know you have to wait for four or five days. You know, I get to, I travel a lot. I spend time with my with my family, so they, as much, there is no reason me waiting for five days in a hotel. I rather go. So I think you, you, uh, my wife and kids will be very happy having me at home for those four or five days. So we have an ultra outlook on how we do business. We are not the only people in the game. A lot of people are in the game. They want to see this succeeding. And if we don't do that, we are going to be left behind. Our infrastructure is going to continue being dilapidated. People are not going to come. 
Um, take, for example, Cameroon. Cameroon's um, petroleum production is somewhere between 50 to 70,000 barrels. That is a huge decline, a huge, mm -hmm. huge decline. The refinery is not functioning. Mm -hmm. um, we now importing petroleum products for the country. And a lot of the licensing round in the country that uh, was done, we're not seeing a lot of new uh, petroleum uh, discoveries that are happening. On a bright spot, the first floating LNG Mm -hmm. uh, that was done, I think, around the African continent, came from, uh, was done in Cameroon with uh, Gola, Perenco, and uh, um, the, the off-takers there, Gazprom and them. So there is a bright spot if when we when we focus, but yeah. a lot more has to be done and you cut the bureaucracy and let the guys work and you would see some real, some real economic development happen. Wow. Uh, I mean, sometimes when you talk about, uh, you know, the government um, trying to, or the, the government ensuring that the, the private sector should operate without trying to regulate compensation, um, I, I understand where you're coming from. But on the other hand, um, when you look at most uh, market systems, um, you would say that, yes, the private companies should operate by themselves, but when they fall on hard times, then they look to the government to try and build them out instead of allowing the market forces to work like they want it when they are getting the benefits or the compensations. So, but the government is also there to ensure that the people are protected because they have a kind of social oversight for the population, whereas a private company is about, it's very profit focused unless they have a, a moral, a huge moral conscience about their, their social responsibility. So it's a bit difficult to marry the two, isn't it? It is. It, 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 is, it, is, it is difficult. And I think so, as much as I believe in free markets and I think market forces should really drive things, government does have a role to play and government should play a fair role as a fair umpire and really encourage growth and stimulate growth, but not be part of... Um, I don't like government coming in and telling you how to live your life and how, how to run your company and how to do things. They've set up rules. We in business have to respect those rules. Those are the laws of the land, respect the laws of the land. But it's wrong when I, for example, I get an office and I get a government inspector comes in five times in a year. I before start operations, they've given me a tax bill. And for the tax inspector to come to my office, I have to pay him his inspection fee. So <laughs> So I pay you to come inspect me. So he shows up. He shows up five times in a year. So you have collects to pay. So, 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 and then you get the health inspector, and then oh, you got the environmental inspector, and you get all of this. So at the end of the day, you tend to dedicate a huge amount of your time trying to deal with bureaucracy and all these illicit payments that you have to you find yourself. And especially if you're working with the foreign corporations, you can't make these illicit payments. So it becomes a struggle to do that. When you do that, and when you become so burdensome to businesses, you take away a lot of young people who have a bright idea and want to go in to do business. We can't expect government to hire everybody. You yeah. talk, let's yeah. put it in Cameroon. Yes. Young people would say, I got out of school, the government hasn't given me a job. To hell with that. Why are you waiting for the government to give you a job? You know, and if everybody sits there and waiting for the government to give them a job, it's crazy. What kind of job do you want the government to give you? You can, you know, we need to create an environment where these young people can create jobs for themselves. They can create their own opportunities and they can become the next Max Zuckerbergs, the next billionaires, than being happy to settle for 50,000 francs a month in salary and say we work. You're just creating a, a cycle where people would never think above what they are, and then you create this, a, a environment of patronage where you say, I gotta be here because I'm waiting for this. We need to create an environment where people, I, I wanna see a lot more young people out of Cameroon going out to become big time, big time entrepreneurs, yeah. doing well, 
And you know, you don't you you don't, you, you, you don't just have to sit out there, Pam, and talk about the NJs. Let's talk about the no Js. Let's talk about guys who don't really have a shot, don't have the opportunities I have. They are really the, the groups that we need to be really worried about because when we don't think about those guys, when we don't shape the economy and policies to really profit those guys, mm -hmm. you find them on the streets tomorrow as you find them on the streets tomorrow with guns. You find them on the streets tomorrow with knives, and they can create social havoc. And mm -hmm. that is really where we face, we, where we go into them, we face ourselves, and we need to be careful. Of course, you're very correct. Like we find in Nigeria, we have the MENT, and you have all these uh, militia groups operating from the Niger Delta and uh, involved in a lot of oil bunkering. <laughs> so you get yeah. that. So you, you've highlighted throughout most of your works the improvement in local content laws to ensure that the workforce in the sec in the oil and gas sector has a majority number of employees being from the countries where the resources have been extracted from. So have you observed an improvement in the past two years in how a company in companies actually employing locals as opposed to bringing them from abroad or expatriate, expatriate workers? It is mixed. It is mixed, but it has improved. Um, I think... You know, it only goes with how you um, turn to um, legislate mm -hmm. and what government does. You know, this is one of the places where I believe government can play a big role in carefully looking at local content regulations and saying that we create an environment for locals to come in and to work and develop the economy and really drive things, things, things going. The other thing also have to pay attention and pay attention very carefully is that the more opportunities you create for local people, the better. But it's not just jobs, it is contracts. There is no reason why somebody should come to America and make $100 million and why can't they partner with a local, with a local company and grow together? The thing is that local companies know the culture, they know the community, they can hire people, they can train people, and they can ensure that some of the bottlenecks and loopholes which an international company will go and, would, and they would even fail, local companies can help you really, really um, get through that. With, with, you know, it's not a seamless transition, but it would help you. And I also think that in a sense, we people, the, the people in these communities, they own these resources, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's not it's no longer correct that we can have big multinational corporations come in and then the, the local people don't have anything. You got to think about your people and your community, and they have to be part of it. So I, we we've been really part of doing a lot of local content regulations, local content laws to really see how to empower that because we think when you empower people from bottom then you really have created a framework where you could see the economies really transition and do really better things um, for, for everyday people. And that's really what you got to be paying a lot of attention to. That's really what you have to be looking at. Local is here to stay. We need to create local content. We need to do it more. But also, we need to be smart. We need to be pragmatic. You can't, for example, some, some countries make a mistake to say we want 100% of the employees in this, oil, in this oil field to be locals. Well, that's good, but sometimes you might not have um, all the engineers and the qualified people and everything. So you need, you need to find that, 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 that reasonable balance to make sure that you do not hurt operations and you do not improve operational costs. But keep a pay keen attention to hiring your people because when you hire your people you're going to it's going to, those skills are going to translate into other facets of the economy is there a way of when deals are signed of uh, maybe having a kind of a clause in the contract that talks about skills transference as in you can bring a foreign wo uh, workforce but train the local workforce so that in two or three years time they would be in charge of that operation kind of like how the chinese used to do the, do the technology um you know transfer agreements with u.s companies and that's how they got to improve on their technological skills yes it can be done yes and Why are you doing it? Are we doing it or are we not? We 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 are we are doing some countries are doing it, but it's also a process and it has to come from both sides. 
because you have to also have the right kind of training from the get-go and you, you need you need to, there's a lot of things it's not just enough to say some guy from texas is going to train um somebody in Douala or bamenda on how to do this it's also that both sides have to be willing and committed and able to do that transition so there has to be a company culture that encourages that i also give I also, I also uh, like to highlight to you that sometimes it really takes a lot more dedication to really get somebody to be able to go out there and do this. Mm -hmm. Take for example, you have um, the, the, base, the basics for this comes with how we educate our young people and how we train them. Mm -hmm. If you do these um, technical vocational programs like what you have with the polytechnics, it really works. And it is You'll be very something. You'll be very surprised. You have hundreds, if not thousands, of Cameroonians who went through these polytechnics and higher technical training education programs. They have been very, very able to really turn around the oil and gas industry. But a lot of them are working for Schlumberger. A lot of them are working for Baker Hughes. I mean, my first contract in oil and gas was given to me by a Cameroonian named Sam Safo. He was the, he was the uh, um, director of Schlumberger. I didn't even know how to fill the forms. He took a chance on me. <laughs> he did. I mean, I went in there, they, they had a form. They asked me, how much money do you make? I was so broke. He said, I said $10,000. He said, if you see, he told me, if you say your company doesn't make up your $10,000 a year, nobody will hire you. So he yeah. said, just say you make one million. I'm like, one million. He said, leave it open. If they, if, they, if they ask you tomorrow, you say you made one million CFR. So, <laughs> you know, they had Sam, he was a big brother. He mentored me. We worked really well together and he gave me so much opportunities and we built. And I think we, so when you have pe uh, people come out of this technical background, that is a great foundation to take them to the next level. And you see in that. The issue we have is that we need to use them more. We need to use them to create more opportunities. The problem is that you have politicians running a lot of the technical divisions rather than having guys with technical and business acumen really driving this growth because that is really what you are going to see and it, it, it's going it's going to change. I've been in, in, in business for a while. Most of the people I see running corporations, they either come from technical degrees, the geologists, the engineers, and they go have some business education, they're running. They bring a they bring a different skills. You know, I mean we lawyers, we argue too much, we talk too much, complain too much, and quarrel too much. You know, yeah. don't just doing some of that stuff. You yeah. give you need to create an opportunity for these guys to drive it. If exactly. you create an opportunity, then you're not going to see. And I think for Cameroon, Cameroon is so blessed that this is a great chance where you tap into a lot of Cameroonian expatriates. They're working for they're working for Baker Hughes, they're working for some of the geological companies around the world, they, they're working for some of the best oil companies around the world. You tap into those guys and you say structure some of the stuff that we do. And you, some of them are even in Cameroon. You use that and you really boost that. If you boost, you will be shocked how. But the thing is, but, but, but the thing is, those people are hiding just like you were before you surfaced and um, we fished you out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> so we would know to go and find these people to mentor us and you know you've highlighted the importance of mentoring yeah well, like I, I think, I think you, you you would know but i think you know i don't I, 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 I i'm not very good at politics you know if you try to get me involved in politics i'll be i'll fail so much i wouldn't you, you would be so ashamed of me i yeah. think to create an environment to welcome them yeah, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, I was talking in terms of like mentorship because I just have a question here from Emmanuel for again. He's saying, Mr. Ayuk, we do cherish your in-depth knowledge and skills. Is there a way for young Cameroonians to tag along to you for mentorship or perhaps to tag along to the other gentleman from Slumberger and all the others? That's why I was saying we don't know who you are, so we can't really come to you for mentorship. So how do they do that? 
There is a way to tap along for mentorship. We have a mentorship program with the firm. We do. We we, we actually mentored a really really famous Cameroonian who is uh, who, who does. Uh, he wouldn't like me to mention his name, but he is so famous. He create uh, he creates apps that are being used around the world, and he, uh, I'm really I'm I'm really really honored to be part of his project and. Uh, he, uh, we provide him with all legal services and business advice and everything. We need to tap into that. The, 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 what you have to really look at is you have a lot of young people that really need it. And I think some of us who, through our Western surgeon, have been able to acquire a lot of skills. And gosh, who knows, I'm like at the bottom of so many you know like there are just so many guys who are just doing amazing things they're so smart and i mean pam your 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 level must be so low you choose me you know to in spite of all the smart guys they can have out there i feel sorry for you you know oh. but, <laughs> you know, i need to escape know. the african way. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah you know but they, they they are and i think that has been part of the disconnect between um, um, which that we've we've not seen. I think it's it's an issue of both sides. We have to be honest with ourselves. We have not done a good job in reaching out to the diaspora. We in Africa, we've not appreciated them, and I think we cannot just look at Cameroonians in the diaspora and say these guys don't want to help. They don't want to do things. Some of the vitriolic comments that you put, that we put about them is not good. We need to change that. Mm -hmm. But also, they also have to also reach out and work with a lot of young people, especially at the universities, especially at the technical colleges. It is really going to change a lot because there are a lot of kids whom they just need a hand and they need someone to look at them and tell them it'll be okay. And it also helps them to not make certain mistakes in life, mm -hmm. you know. Thing, that is really something that we have to pay attention because you have a lot of young people which they need a lot of hand, a lot of hand holding, and they need a lot of uh, a, a, a lot a, a lot of support. And I continue to say I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have a lot of people hold my hand and give me a, a shot at life. And a lot more people could use that, and they're smarter than me. This is smarter than a lot of uh, um, us who tend to have opportunities, and we just have to do that. It is it is something we try to do as a firm, we try to do as a chamber, but we cannot do everything. We, I think, the more we do to create this business incubators and create and level the playing field, it's better than waiting to go home and do some charity. In I, you know, the charity is good. Don't get me wrong. But you really have to create opportunities so that people can collectively develop their communities by themselves. Wow. Those are grand words there. Um, <laughs> can you believe it? We've almost been speaking for like two hours. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I was a bit worried because I thought you might not have enough time. And I know that, you know, you've been very busy today. Oh, yeah, I, love I have nowhere to go. <laughs> oh, okay. Because I was told that you are participating in the LA Book Festival. So I, for some reason, I, I was thinking in my head that it's in America. It's probably people still walk around because I saw people out um, on the beach somewhere. So, <laughs> and you are important. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the thank Yankees you. Thank you for gracing our platform. So I just want to let our audience know about your books um, so that they can go and support you, especially uh, your recent book that you just um, released. So I'm going to share that with the audience. Let's see where it is see. the photo. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I forgot about that. I was actually going to bring that up. So there we have it. It's in the background, guys. So um, it's Billions at Play. Uh, make sure that you don't miss that book. And um, he's got another one, uh, <laughs> Barrels. So is it Big Barrels? Um, yeah. I, 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 like I, I actually like enjoy that man. one. I actually enjoy the first book because it goes yeah. through all African countries. Uh, the second one I do yeah. like, but I like the first the first a lot better so um yeah his recent book billions at play the future of african energy and doing deals 
So there, if you want to learn a bit more, please, guys, let's read and understand these things because knowledge is power. Or you can also go back to reading his book that he published two years ago, which is Big Barrels, um, African Oil and Gas and the Quest for Prosperity. So um, we've clearly come to the end of this program. And, and I was just wondering if you had any last words to say before we close. No, I say thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I think... Uh... Phew. It's actually the first interview I've done with the camera with the uh, Cameroonian app. It's amazing. Yay! Uh, <laughs> we got that. I think <laughs> I think we 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 all as Cameroonians have uh, a deep role to play with the development of our communities. And no matter what happens, we you know we we have we can only shape what we put our mind in okay. and our country and our communities are going to get better. These are some really difficult times in the country where you have a crisis in the Northwest and the Southwest region, you have um, COVID-19 and you have so much social ills. We should not forget that. Um, a lot of our brothers and sisters are refugees or internally displaced people. And this is time where we all have to keep a, a watchful eye and hope that we can find ways to br um, break our differences, unite ourselves. And as much as we want to look at the oil and gas sector, but we also have to pay attention to improving the lives of people so that we don't return into where we have young men and young women finding themselves in harm's way and all of that. And I think um, with what you do and a lot of what your listeners do, it's, 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 a, it's our chance for us to really pay attention to the natural resource sector, pay attention to do for ourselves and not wait for government to do a lot. I'm big on not waiting for government. I, I, I'm not, I, I don't believe in politicians that much. I'm much more apolitical, but thank you so much for having me and uh, God bless you. And uh, God bless all your listeners and may you continue to make all of us proud with uh, the work you do in giving Cameroonians and little country boys like me a voice to talk to our people. And uh, I, am, I can only appreciate you. And thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us, NJ, despite your busy schedule. And please, <laughs> you're far too humble. Um, we're, we're so grateful that you could share your knowledge and expertise in the oil and gas sector. And you've been with us for about two hours and we know how busy you are. So for that, we're so, so grateful. So actually, the thanks we're giving to you. So thank you for spending this time with us. And um, to our gracious audience, thank you for participating. And thank you, Emmanuel, for, for all those questions. Um, we hope that you enjoyed the segment of Facing the Facts. And do not miss next week's segment with uh, Viola Lewin, who will be discussing technology meeting finance. And we'll learn about Viola's company, Ovamba, and how she raised over $1 million yeah. to change the game for SMEs in Central and West Africa. So She's thank a smart you. woman. Yeah, she is. She's a really, really great, great woman. Great yeah. woman. So watch us next week. She's going to be here same time, 6 p.m. British summer time or Cameroon time, GMT plus one. Um, so you. yeah, we'll be discussing finance mix technology. So thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Goodbye. God bless you, Pam. Thank you so much. <laughs>